There we yep. go. All right. Welcome to another episode of the King's Couch. And this is our first Zoom interview with anybody. And I have the pleasure of interviewing an old friend of mine, an amazing musician with an amazing story to tell, Mr. Greg King. Uh, he's well known for being the keyboard player of the band TSOL. And on top of that, he's a very amazing composer and um, songwriter. So Greg, how are you? I'm good, Sulo, thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so like all guests I have on the show, I like to go back and start from the beginning, how you got inspired to become a musician and how music resonated with you. So let's start there. Well, I was a, my, my mom's a singer and it was a music teacher and there's a lot of music in our family. And I, I played piano since I was a little kid, probably, I guess I was probably like six when I started taking piano lessons. But even before that, I mean, my mom tells me little stories about, oh yeah, you'd be up on the piano and banging away. So I, I mean, I just have it in me, man. And I'm one of those kids that like, I took piano lessons, but I wanted to practice. Like I, I really enjoyed it. And, um, and so I was kind of locked in pretty early. Um, but I had a really, some really, one really great teacher who encouraged me to write music. And so even from the age of like, you know, eight years old or whatever, I was playing my own pieces at, at recitals and stuff, you know? So that was kind of cool. And it kind of gave me the bug, you know? And um, I'm a huge Elton John fan. And I loved, like, I was like, man, I want to do that, <laughs> you know, whatever. I mean, it's like, he plays the piano and sings and stuff. And I'm not much of a singer. I, but but that thing, you know, it, you know, just kind of getting locked in by that. My older brother's records and stuff, and just, you know, I mean, I was in from an early age, you know. But I was that kid who would actually practice the piano, you know. I mean, I wanted to take lessons. I wanted to keep doing it. I liked. It. I enjoyed playing. And when I got that bug to kind of create too, like that was a really cool component. Because you know, I played a lot of classical music and you know, work on all that stuff. And I did like these juries and all that kind of stuff. But but there was always the thing of like, you can make your own stuff up, you know? And just having permission to do that is a really cool thing to give a young musician, you know? Cause like a lot of times people think, well, I can't, I could never write music. I could play music, but you know, so I did, I felt like, yeah, I can, I can make up my own stuff from the beginning, you know? So that was kind of a pretty cool foundation to have. That's cool. And uh, was piano your first instrument that you picked up? Yeah, yeah, that's my first first deal. And then, um, but you know, I play a lot of different mus uh, instruments. But I, I played bass when I was a kid, you know, like a yeah, early teen. You know, so if you're gonna be in a rock band, it's kind of like, well, you gotta have some other gig, you know. <laughs> and so I, I, I was like the little John Paul Jones kid who played bass and keyboards. I loved, I loved that Zeppelin man. So that he was my idol. You know, John Paul Jones was the guy. So that's cool. It's like I'm gonna play. You know, I'm gonna play bass and play keyboards. And then I picked up guitar when I was like, uh, you know, like, I guess probably about 14, 15. And I really got into classical guitar for a few years and, and you know, finger picking stuff and all that. And so, yeah, so that's the, so that I tell people, it's like, well, anything with frets or keys on it, pretty much I could figure something out. Like I got a wall of other, like not like playing gigs with them, but I mean, if you give me a bazooki, I'll, I mean, I have one and I'll, I'll, fuck around with it until I come up with something cool on it, you know? I mean, sometimes I need to like refresh and review, but um, yeah, it, it, so that, but yeah, piano has always been the foundation, the kind of the, my main instrument for sure. That's actually what I started with too, and I, I just got bored with it. <laughs> and yeah, I well, that more. happens a lot. I know it's so funny. I'm like the total anomaly because it's like, I'm like, I never stopped taking lessons, you know? I mean, eventually you do, but I mean, all through, you know, I mean, all through high school. And I was even, I mean, I was at, when I joined TSOL, I was a classical piano major at Cal State Long Beach. I had done one year. So I joined TSOL when I was 18 and I had finished a year of college. And I was like, okay, so uh, I'm going to go do this now. You know? Were yeah, you part so. of the, the first incarnation of TSOL? I was. I joined in 1982 for Beneath the Shadows. And so, um, but I was a fan. You know, I mean, I'd been going to see him play. And so, you know, when the first EP came out and danced with me, and they're a couple of years older than me, so I would go to the Cuckoo's Nest. And I, I had a, a friend of mine, Gil Ogden, was this uh, he, friend from high school, and he was the bouncer there. He was this crazy, like, really tough kid, wrestler, yoked up guy. And, and he got this gig 
I don't think Jerry Roach even knew how old he was. He was 15, bouncing at the cuckoo's nest. But he looked like a grown man, and he was tough as fuck, and he would get us in. And so I was going to the cuckoo's nest from a real young age, and I saw a lot of those early TSOL shows, and we, I was a fan, man, and, you know, didn't have the honor of joining them a couple of years later it was pretty rad. Yeah. You know, because I was a really cool documentary I found on YouTube all about the cuckoo's nest and, and those days and how big of a staple that was for punk rock and shows back in. Oh, yeah, man. It was our CBGBs, you know, for sure. Was it Clockwork Orange County? That one? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because I did the music for that too, and I'm really I'm, <laughs> how <laughs> ironic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's funny, and I'm I'm in it a little bit too. But yeah, that that guy, the director Jonathan Mills, is a really good friend of mine. Um, I, we met on that, but but we've worked on other stuff together since, and yeah, he's really cool. But that's a cool story, man. I like, it. yeah, all those, and you know, it's funny because um, me and Steve Soto knew each other from like church camp. Like we both went to Quaker church. And so we knew each other from like 12 years old. We didn't know each other that well, but it was like, oh, music guy, music guy. You know, we kind of, we sort of knew each other and stuff. And me and Tony from the adolescents actually went to middle school together. And so it's fun. It's just so rad that I'm, you know, to have those kinds of, like, you know, rest in peace, Steve. But, you yeah. know, we stayed friends, man. And we were really friends, good friends till the end of his life. And Tony and I are still pals. and you know, to have these friendships and relationships that go back, like, you know, a long time, man, like for over 40 years, some of them, you know, so. Yeah, lifetime friendships. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that whole era of punk rock, see it, you know, I'm in my early 40s, so I totally miss that window of the 80s and the late right. 70s. But I love hearing stories about people joining their favorite bands, going yeah, from yeah, being yeah. fan to hey i'm yeah. the new singer of black flag you know what yeah, I mean? right. stuff like that no it's so rad man because i mean i'm telling you i i saw a lot of bands at the cuckoo's nest and i still went to a lot of early punk shows and man there's nothing like a tsl show at the cuckoo's nest it was just like what the fuck it's like shark frenzy and i was kind of <laughs> I was a little kid man but it's just like they're you know they're playing sounds of laughter and it's just like it's like this thing you know and so yeah i was totally a fan man i love them and and you know um it was it was uh it was super cool i always well i always thank uh dave dave vanian and, and captain sensible because we've played some shows with them and i know them i've worked with dave a little bit and you know it's like if it wasn't for the damned you know who knows if i would ever been in tsl because you know just was expanding anyway but you know the it's like certain bands kind of gave permission to use keyboards and stuff. I mean, there's a lot of keyboards in punk rock, but not as people don't think so. Like the Stranglers, man, I love the Stranglers. Oh, the Stranglers, great example. Greenfield, one of my heroes, man. And then you listen to Machine Gun Etiquette and Captain's playing piano on it, man. I mean, that's early, that's the second damn record. It's crazy, you know? Yeah, the Addicts with that, what was that, with the fiddle player? Yeah, true, right, right, right. Yeah, so there's, there's room for a lot of different elements in punk, but particularly, keyboards and particularly the damn because i'm a huge damn fan and and we had that in common you know so the so you know ron's there are everybody in the band is a big damned fan and and so i i mean to listen to the black album and then get asked to join tsol is like what the fuck okay yes i know exactly what to do you know so yeah so it's super cool yeah awesome so speaking of being a fan uh for all the viewers out there tsol is one of my top 10 favorite bands of all time and I first met them uh, at Warp Tour. I believe it was '99 or 2000. I'm not sure if you were on. I, I wasn't back in the Tour. fold at that point. Yeah. Yeah, that was after Todd Barnes had already passed away, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I think it was 2000. Yeah, because that was the year the Lunatic Chicks played, and I also met them too. Oh, right. And that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah. I actually just saw them in Vegas at Punk Rock Bowling. It was. Uh, oh, let's go. A great experience, but uh, you know, first person I met was Jack, and I had discovered TSOL through the movie Suburbia years before, and I thought they were so different, and I just connected with, with TSOL and everything about TSOL instantly. And Jack was the nicest guy in the world, and gave me his number. I remember even calling him when they were recording for Nitro Records. I can't remember what album that was, but he right fully like. Here took the time to talk to me for like 20 minutes on the phone. I was like, dude, aren't you in the middle of a recording session? <laughs> so long story short, years later, I became a concert promoter. 
I, I remember being a kid going to all ages shows and wanting every aspect of it, being in a band, booking my own shows, opening up for my heroes. And with TSOL, I accomplished all those feats. I went from being a fan to working at a venue where you guys played, to booking you guys, to opening up for you guys, to eventually crossing off the last thing on my list and recording you guys at my recording studio that I used to own, that which was, was an amazing awesome. experience. So I can't think of another band that I had that kind of connection and lifetime friendship with. And you guys have just been so stellar, so killer, so kind and so supportive. And, you know, uh, it's amazing to have you on this show and just, you know, share some of these old stories and and just talk about the old days and, and you know, just chit chat. You know? Yeah, that's cool, man. Well, thanks, Sula. We appreciate it, dude, because, you know, when people have enthusiasm for it, you know, and when people want to like, yeah, no, I got this right, cool idea and we're, you know, and I want to do this thing and we want to do, let's do a show and let's do it. You know, like we get off on that because you know we're old and jaded so it's like i mean i'm not actually not jaded because that but that's how you stay not jaded you gotta like you know it's like when people are enthusiastic about it you know you feed off of that and that's definitely the case with you man you know we always we dig you and and appreciate your enthusiasm and interest in making things happen and and we always appreciate that kind of dynamic man because that's you know it, it's rare when people um you know, when you connect on people like, with people like that, you know, so that's, it's, it's been a pleasure uh, knowing you and getting to know you through all these things and, and, you know, getting to, um, you know, see you grow with, with music and with the business stuff and the studio and all that stuff. It's just, it's cool, man. It's like, you know, Oh wow! Now this now we're gonna do this thing. Oh, that's great! Yeah, let's go. Let's go record at Sulo's place. Yeah, Jack's like, we, what are you up to next, Sulo? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we and we try to say yes, man. At least I, you know, like my whole thing is like, fuck yeah, man. Let's do it. You know, let's why not? You know, I I'm trying not to. I don't. I try not to think of reasons why not to do something. I you know, I mean, sometimes you know things don't make sense or whatever. But I mean, generally, it's like, yeah, okay, why not? <laughs> let's try it. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of my sentiment too. Time management, you know, everyone's got busy schedules and, you know, being in a band. And for the viewers that don't understand what being in a band is like, it's like being married to a bunch of dudes. <laughs> and if you, you sometimes even add a female in the dynamic, it can get a little weird. Uh, we've even tried that and it didn't work out. Um, but being in a band, it, you got to base yours. You can't just think the world revolves around your schedule. You have to be mindful that everyone's got a different life you know around you and especially when you go on tour putting everybody in the same vehicle for that amount of time can be strenuous it sounds exciting and i'm not trying to discourage anybody out there that wants to start a band or go on tour but it's easier said than done you know and there's a lot of work that goes into that so why don't we talk a little bit about some of your experiences greg and just give people a re realistic like idea of what it's like to be in a band, deal with different relationships. Uh, you know, you can even talk about, you know, some of the experiences you've been through, you know, battling addictions, you know, uh, fights. Um, I'm just trying to give people a real idea of what it's like out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it is like being married to people and, you know, to but and, and you just it's, i think a lot of it's just like figuring out how you instead of trying to change people all the time you just go okay well this is what i'm you know this is our dynamic everybody well, there's a different dynamic in every relationship in the band and just being cool with that and letting those things take their own course and then you know that's a big part of it because if you fight against that or if you you know get angry at your singer for being a singer i mean you know it's like that that everybody has a different kind of personality and if if you you know typically singers have a certain there's a certain vibe i mean for a guy to be dynamic on stage is going to have a certain character kind of thing and, and you have to be cool with that and you can't expect everybody to be be the same and so because we're all different so it's cool when that happens you know when you get comfortable with that and you know I, look tsol i've known those guys um you know the same four dudes have been playing together i mean we've had some gaps and stuff but i mean you know 40 almost 40 years for me and for over 40 years for them so you know 
it's just a lot of it is just tolerance and just being cool with how other people are and just you know just not worrying about it too much and just stay in your lane and being cool with the different relationships that you have you know and we're all sober and that helps a lot because you know we've had our whole i've had problems with addiction i've been sober for 20 almost 27 years and so and the other guy's got a lot of time too and so that you know having those that skill set of dealing with stuff is helpful you know what i mean and 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 we probably wouldn't we wouldn't be a band if we weren't all clean you know that certainly helps you know but um but yeah it's a it's a dance you gotta do you know you gotta like know you gotta be respectful of who you're talking to and where they're at and if they're having a bad day or whatever because at the end of the day it's just it's easy to say take offense or say it's all about me you know but it's not about me man you know what i mean i try to keep my shit straight but you know things come up and you got to deal with them the best you can and i just try not to take things personally i think that's probably the motto the most important motto is not to take things personally because people have bad days they have things and you just try to get to the bottom of things when there's conflict and not you know and you know figure out where you're where we're all on the same page you know Trust me. <clears throat> I don't know if you realize, but my sitting in my office at work, I work at a integrative and a holistic medical center mm -hmm. as a, a neurotherapist, a life right. coach, nutrition coach. So I, I got to practice what I preach every day: right. stress management. I'm trying to de-stress people, and I'm an empath, so <laughs> right, right. you know it's easier said than done. So I, I can totally resonate with what you just said there. Yeah. Um, so. Let's talk a little bit about your sons, because I got a little bit of history. I believe I booked either one or both of them uh, at some point at the Jumping Turtle over the years. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, let's let's talk about how you became a father and how rad it is to you know see them following in your footsteps. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah. My wife, my wife and I are still together, and we we had kids young, man. I was like twenty six when Elvis was born. My sons are Elvis and Max. And they play in this band called Fiddler, and and um, but they used to be in a band called the Diffs, and you booked them there, and they were both in the Diffs too. Yeah, okay. so Max is the drummer, and Elvis is the guitar player, and so yeah, I mean it was cool because they, you know, we were kind of just figuring it out as we went along, and they're 13 months apart. We had two kids right in a row. It's like, whoa, okay, cool, we're parents now, you know. But um, <laughs> be, be, being a young parent is actually kind of cool. We were always the youngest parents, like it was like you know. Elvis was born in 90 and Max in 91. So, you know, we were, it was a trip, um, but it's a learn as you go program, you know, but they were always into music and played from a young age. I got them piano lessons and stuff. And Max was always on the, you know, playing drums since he was like two, man. We got him a drum set when, on his first birthday. I mean, he just resonated with drums and, you know, they both play, they will play a, a lot of different instruments, but and they both played piano when they were little kids and they kind of you know wound up um you know finding their instruments and you know they loved like the oh well, i didn't push the punk rock stuff on them i mean you know we listened to a lot of different kind of music in the house but they really did gravitate toward that stuff so they were di my wife is an old punk she's from huntington beach and was the first girl with pink hair in huntington and all that and so robin and so um i remember yeah, your wife really cool. yeah she was always very sweet yeah, yeah you've met her yeah you've met her a few times i think and and so so the kids just started digging through the crates, man. You know what I mean? Like they they go to find our old records and listen to germs and you know, and they did have their little they had their little kind of uh phase when they were like eight or nine, it's probably like nine, ten or whatever, where they're eight or nine, maybe when they were, you know, like Blink was big and you know, Green Day and all that stuff. And they really dug all that. But then man, it was like once they really they dug in and like wait what circle jerks wait uh the germs what's the screamers single what's you know <laughs> and so they were really yeah so that like their whole thing with the diffs was like you know west coast punk rock 78 to 81 or whatever you know what i mean <laughs> dead right. kennedy's germs black flag little tsol and they're probably you know whatever just it, that was their aesthetic and and you know as you might remember the that little the kid Richie, the singer kid, was like you know he's like a little Darby man. I mean he, oh, they had, yeah, they had a cool cool vibe, and so it was fun for them because it was right around the time that I started playing with TSOL again because I'd been out of touch. I mean, look, I'm, I'm a pa parent of young kids. I'm trying to build a business. I'm writing music for movies and TV sh stuff and all that, and we we were you know 
we've always been friends, but you know, there's times when you get out of touch. And that was one of those times. But it was funny, right before the diff started, and right before I started playing with TSOL again, that show at the House of Blues where the guy got shot, I was like, you know what, man, they're playing shows. I need to reach out. My kids are into punk rock. Like, um, we're gonna come. We're gonna come to the show. Oh, yeah, yeah, come down. I'm like, well, okay, so um my kids are like, you know, nine and ten or whatever. I was like, well, what's the bus? We should go on stage. Okay, so we're on stage watching TSL's great show. It's all cool, really bringing back a bunch of memories and stuff. Dude gets shot three feet away from my son and, and blood spurting out of this guy's face. It was like, what the hell? And it was a it was a really uh, a pretty gnarly event, but whatever. It things happen, especially what was going through your mind when that happened when you witnessed I'll oh, just keep them safe. But I mean, I realized it was like oh, this, you know, it is this is not like, it seemed like, you know, um, some, there was a one, there was an altercation. It wasn't like somebody's shooting up the whole stage or anything, you know? So. Did it create any kind of PTSD for your kid? No, no, they didn't have anything like that. We just kind of laugh it off. It was, it was like this crazy, like jump start into punk rock shows because, because soon after that, I, I, I started playing with TSOL again. And then my kids started this band, the diffs. And then it was like, well, they, one of their first, well, they had played some house parties and stuff, but then they played the Grisham for Governor show, um, with whatever that Oh, was. I voted for Jack. I yeah, voted isn't that, that funny? I did too, why not, you know? Dude, I thought it was genius. <laughs> Make it matter. So there was this Grisham for Governor show at the, um, at the Henry Fonda uh, in Hollywood. And so that was one of their first big shows. So that it was, but it was fun for them because they got to play with, not just because of me, but they were good. You know, it's like, there are these, 10, 11 year old kids who like were playing like the germs, you know what I mean? And it was, it was, and their songs were really good. And so the other bands noticed, you know, and so they got to play with a lot of their idols and it was, you know, around that time, the early two thousands, that was a real punk rock revival. You know, a lot of the bands were playing again and it was just, there was a cool thing happening and they were part of that wave and it was really fun for them. And it was fun for me too, because I ha hadn't, they even been playing shows much. I mean, I, I was in the studio all the time. So it was a really cool thing to get to be back playing, playing with those guys and, you know, and, and have my kids play on some of those shows and then getting to go see them with other people. It's funny. I was telling somebody a funny story about Keith wouldn't let them play with the circle jerks for a long time. I mean, they play with everybody, man, you know, and the germs were actually doing shows because they had Shane West and they were making that movie. And so I was working with Shane West's other band, Johnny was. Oh, right? really? I stopped working with him uh, after the Germans reunited and started, you know, doing a bunch of dates and everything. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's interesting. You just brought that up. Yeah, and that was that time, and they 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 liked them a lot, obviously, because it was like, well, they're basically, you know, that they're kind of like the baby germs, and so that was. But playing all those shows was a great experience for them, and getting to see them and those and all those contacts. But finally. It took him a couple of years before Keith would let them play with the circle. Jerks. He's like, well, we'll say, well, come on, Keith. Like they knew him and, you know, it was like Uncle Keith, but it's like, no. A little crotchety. Yeah. And he's <laughs> I, like, I, we you play know, with circle jerks too. Uh, in pay your dues, kids, you know. Right. But it was funny because the, then when um, Fiddler was together, they they actually, when Off came out, they actually, Fiddler actually opened up that. They, they did play, the Diffs did open up for the circle jerks several times, but then when Off came out, they, um, asked them to uh, open up for them at the whiskey at the record release of the uh, of off so that was pretty pretty cool like full circle thing you know yeah there was uh i think yeah my buddy mario was playing drums and off. yeah mario's yeah. great man Love yeah. Him. yeah he's yeah. awesome yeah it's yeah. always cool when you see you know your, your san diego friends going off and playing with their heroes <laughs> you know yeah I mean? yeah totally so it's right? like that thing and we you know full circle it goes back to what we were talking about earlier yeah, you know, yeah. being a fan and then being able to be a part of that band. Yeah, you know? it is funny. Um, my buddy Johnny Two Bags is out on the road with me first in the Gimme Gimmies, and John Reese is playing guitar. And I'm like, John wow. Reese, yes. really? Wow. There's the two guitar players, Two Bags, Reese, and I, dude, I love Rocket so much. I mean, I'm, I love that band. They're so great. I mean, I, they, that, I really, you know, I love them. So I got a good, I got a heart place and, and Hot Snakes and there's so many great bands, man. It's like, there's that's a, a great documentary that came out a few years back, I think in like 2014 called This Is Gonna Blow. I believe that's the title oh, about that whole era. 
I actually have it on my Google Drive. I can send it to you. Uh, yeah, let's go. I'd love to, I'd love to yeah, see Yeah, it's it. yeah, it's I... a great documentary about 90s. Lucy's Fur Coat, uh, Drive Like Jay Who, all, all those right. bands. Yeah, yeah. 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 I remember yeah. seeing Rocket at the cat at the at the uh not the cafe. It was at the uh oh man, what's that club on in Hollywood? Um guy. I'm old and I, it takes me a moment to remember. It's all good, dude. Club, club, club lingerie. Yeah. And oh, just club blown, lingerie. Yeah. Blown away, man. They're all wearing the bowling shirts and the thing. And they get the horn section and just like, oh, wow. They were so exciting, man. Uh, and that Scream Jackie of Scream, I think, is like one of the, it's the uh, to me, it's, it's that's probably my favorite rock record of the 90s, which is saying a lot, man. I mean, they're a great <laughs> band. Well, they're one of the most legendary bands that ever come out of San Diego. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. awesome. Yeah, definitely. Um, and going back to your kids for a second, you actually have played, uh, or Max played drums for TSOL, filled in. He How did, yeah. Gig? He had done it before, like even from the young age, like I don't know, maybe like, maybe he was like 15 or something, you know, Jack did this little stunt, like, you know, well, our drummer, uh, who who can play drums? Do we can play drums? You know, Jack came up on stage and he played it played like World War Three with us or something. And then he did fill in, like did a show at the um, uh, observatory, did the whole show with us. But then later, but just a few years ago when we played Coachella, we were between drummers. We've had a lot of drummers. Antonio's our drummer now and he's great. We love him. But we had we were sort of between drummers and Fiddler was not on tour. And I was like, Jack, listen, man, we got this show. It was sort of a one off because we hadn't been playing a whole lot. And so I was like, let's get Max, man. That'd be fucking rad, you know? And so we did. And Max played drums with us at Coachella. And that was so cool, man. It was really, really cool. the observatory date. I think you guys were open up for Pennywise or something like that. Um, oh, yeah. I don't, yeah, I can't even remember. I remember that. that's when Jack was making his own, like, suit jackets oh, or something like that. You know, the spray painted stuff you guys have oh, for right, sale. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. That was yeah, right. So Right when you guys released, uh, what was the name of that record? Um, I think it was the last one you guys put out, actually. Oh, right. Trigger Complex. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was so so cool to have. Um, yeah, that's right. Because that was because Chip played on that record. Chip Hanna, who's a great drummer, and we love playing with him and still really good friends with him. But, you know, sometimes just things just don't all line up like we want to. He lives in Arizona, whatever. But it, so had Chip, Chip had left, and then we got Max before we got Antonio. And so, um, yeah, so that was a pretty magical little uh, moment, you know, to be able to kind of play with my son at, at, at a show like that. Definitely a bucket list thing, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I was so stoked. Like, it, I mean, especially with the history that I have with all of you guys to watch that moment in front yeah. of a sold out crowd was just, as a, someone spectating from the audience it was amazing to see that you know yeah <laughs> yeah and and you know there is that thing too like with my boys like their brothers playing you i watch them play together and it's like there's a connection and you know when, even and with my sons too when we play music together it's like there's a connection that you it's just you know i mean it's there and you lock in man it's cool you know it's really 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 great right. so that was, a, that was a neat thing to get to do i'm surprised they didn't interview you for the other f word that documentary. All yeah, about. well, it was done before. I, I actually did a song in that movie. That that the, the um, I did a song with Dwayne about. Uh, it was a song I wrote with him about his kid Chess. That you know, there's that really sad song. Yeah, uh, I know. Um, and that and that's me. I I I wrote that and arranged and played everything on that too. Yeah, so that's really? me and that was a killer Dwayne. song. Yeah, so I did have something to do with that movie. Yeah. But no, it was, you know, I, and I, I'm actually friends with the director now, Andrea, she's great. But we, it was just one of those things where we, you know, it didn't make, you know, they didn't know whatever it was. It's always like a certain scope of reference. And I don't think they really had that field of reference at the time. But then, you know, we, we they did, man, we should have interviewed you for this movie. This would have made sense. But I did have a little hand in it. So that was cool in the post part of it, you know, like getting a song in there and stuff. So. Okay, well, that's a great segue into our next topic. Let's talk about how you got into scoring. Yeah, well, I always wanted to do that kind of stuff. I always thought, wow, it'd be cool to do like music for film or whatever. And, and um, I'd always thought about that. And then, you know, I I spent a lot of my 20s on the road with bands and stuff, you know, because I after TSOL, I played with Dylan and 
um, for a while. And I'm, you know, and then I played with the church from Australia and I was in that band Berlin for, you know, touring the world. Wait, you were in Berlin for a little while? I was in Berlin. Yeah. I love Berlin. That's so rad. I played on that record, Count Three and Pray, which is like their last full album that, that take my breath away and everything, you know? So that record was, um, that single propelled the big world tour. And I was on that and I was like 80s. Seven, I guess, or 86, 86. That's a great record. I yeah. didn't know you played on that. That's awesome. Okay, man. Yeah, I got a checkered past, man. You know, and so, so that, but then I, but I was like, man, you know, and then I, my wife and I got married and we had, you started having kids and I was still doing a lot of like recording and playing and stuff, but it was just like, man, I go, this is probably unsustainable, you know, to do this road guy thing and touring musician thing. And I didn't really enjoy it that much. And I got a lot in, you know, uh, from a young age so um you know i i like the idea of doing music for stuff and sort of stumbled into that you know i scored some films me and actually me and alex gibson who's the guy who wrote the music for suburbia okay. he was an inspiration to me too because i didn't really know him but he was in a band called b people who i liked and went to see and 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 um you know i was like well wait that's that dude from b people why how is he doing the music for a movie you know, like I could fucking do that, you know? Yeah. And so Alex and I became friends actually because I was on tour with the church and his band, he had this band after B people called Passionel and Passionel opened up these um, shows for the church. And so I was like, oh, okay, this is like 84. And so, um, so I got to know him, we got to be friends and we were like, well, let's, let's, we should, we gotta do some music together or whatever. And I, you know, cause I sort of like held them up on a thing. I'll go, wow, Alex, man, he's that guy who did the music for Suburbia. And then we became friends and we were writing some songs together and stuff. And then this movie thing came up and, and they loved these pieces that we had. And we were just gonna maybe make a record or something, but they wanted to use it in this movie and it's called From Hollywood to Deadwood. And it, it was on Island Pictures and um, and it didn't do a whole lot, but it was, a, you know, it was like on a major thing and they had a budget and they paid us money to write music for this movie and we were green and everything, but he had done a little bit of that before. And so, um, you know, but like that, that was pretty, that kind of locked me in pretty hard getting doing the music for that movie. And so, um, you know, I just, I sort of stumbled into getting gigs like that. And then I kind of, you know, uh, you know, did some, actually LA gear was one of my first, first clients. Like they did these like promo videos. This is like in the Carl Malone era. Like yeah, I think that, no, exactly. the talking. backboard. I did the music for a lot of those things. And and then I just kind of kept meeting people and getting into that. And so, you know, I, I um, the nice thing about advertising is they do have budgets, you know, and so you, I, it's a nice, this nice way to make a living. And then you get to do other cool stuff too. And it finances things and you can, you know, afford you to be creative in other ways and all that. And, and that, and so, yeah, so I just kind of kept stumbling into doing those kinds of things and music for picture and stuff. And so that's kind of where it all started though, doing the music from, from Hollywood to Deadwood. Okay. Uh, so for some of the viewers, actually, what am I saying? Some of them, for the viewers out there, can you just list off some of your top accomplishments? Um, yeah. Uh, I've done music for, I mean, I've done like music for like hundreds of commercials, like for Nike and Toyota and whatever. I mean, it's tons and tons of that kind of stuff. And so, and that's been the bulk of my career really like, um, but I, I think um, one of my favorite films that I scored was from, uh, from it was called uh, Confessions of a Superhero. And it's a documentary about the people in front of man's Chinese theater. And it, it has a kind of a little cult following or whatever. And so that, and that was, that was, um, that was a really good one. And we, the, the same director, Matt Ogans and I uh, worked on this movie called Meet the Hitlers. It was all about people named Hitler. And I, I like scoring documentaries. I mean, that's one of the things that I really enjoy because you really have to, it's a fine line. Like you can't, push the emotion of the film too hard, but you also have to support things or what's happening in the film, you know? And so um, that, that is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a delicate balance and a delicate dance that you have to do to try to, you know, make things more emotional, but not be too heavy handed about it, you know? So, yeah, so that's, a, those are both ones that I really, really enjoy. And I play, actually played keyboards on the soundtrack to Repo Man. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. That movie. I was I was really fr good friends with the plugs, um, and Charlie Quintana, rest in peace. He's a really great drummer. In fact, the plugs were the first punk rock show I ever went to. Me and Tony Adolescent went to see the plugs and the crowd, 
at this little tiny club in Irvine at the campus. It was called the Pateau Cafe. It was like this little tiny place and they were having punk shows there. And this is, I mean, I don't know, probably, I guess like 79 or something like that, 78, maybe, probably 1979. And, uh, and, and the plug, and I always like the plugs, man, that electrify me record. Oh my God. So if you don't know it, you got to check that out. It's great, man. They're, it's, they're great. And so when I played with Dylan, that, uh, Charlie Quintana was the drum drummer from the plugs was playing with Dylan too. We were both on this video playing with Bob and, and I, I, I was so funny because people were like, Oh, you're going to do this thing with Bob Dylan. And I go, well, actually I'm more excited about meeting Charlie from the plugs, but, uh, but we got to be friends and Dylan was like, Hey, um, you guys should come up to the house. There was a bunch of musicians there and stuff for the video, but he, for some reason he keyed in on us and was like, you know, come up to the house. And so Bob like, paid us to be in his band and so we were because he wanted to play with some younger guys and stuff or whatever and so anyway charlie and i became friends and through that playing with dylan i wound up working with the plugs a lot and and then they became the cruzados later but while there were the plugs they did the music for repo man and so it was like a band it was really uh tito the singer and steve huffstetter the guitar player wrote the music but the band played it you know and they were, I was kind of like the auxiliary member, you know, so I played, uh, there's all that kind of like, oh, oh, it was that emulator is like old sampler, like early, early sampling. And, but they had, it was like, wow, we have, we can do strings on the machine. Fuck yeah. You know? And so it was really fun. I was a kid, man. You know, I mean, all this stuff, I was a kid, I mean, I was probably 20 years old when I did that, but, oh, do you see? That was, but that was a cool one. We didn't know. I mean, we knew, you know, I mean, we knew who Alex Cox was, you know, because he had, I think he had done Sid and Nancy, but, or maybe Sid and Nancy was after, but he had a reputation one way or the other. And it was, Sid and Nancy a, was, I believe, 85. Yeah. So it was, after, it was the next film, but, but we knew that he was a deal, you know what I mean? I met him and he was cool and we, it was on Universal Repo Man, you know, so it was like kind of a big deal to be on this soundtrack and stuff. And so, uh, but yeah, but we didn't know it was going to be like this crazy cult thing, you know? And so, um, yeah, that's me. So on the soundtrack, that song Real Tin, I'm playing keyboards on that. So, I mean, I'm playing a lot of keyboards throughout the whole score, but that's where I'm on the soundtrack. So that's pretty funny. Kids, if you haven't seen Repo Man. <laughs> yeah, go check it out. It down. What was that, Emilio Estevez, right? Yeah, yeah. Emilio Estevez. Yeah, right? Alexander yeah. Schloss is in it too, man. It's pretty right. funny. And yeah. But yeah, and then Suburbia, which was pretty funny, because you said, I mean, a lot of people, that's their first exposure to TSML, you know, and that was like, um, you know, being in that movie was pretty fun, too, you know. Were you there when they did the screening a couple months back? Um, I forget what it was for, but uh, what's the director's name? Uh, Penelope. Yeah. Yes, that's I was there, actually. Yeah, yeah. And I filled in. For Let's two. talk about that. Yeah, that was really cool. She didn't go. She got sidetracked and couldn't and didn't make it actually to the screening but we had a screening down on Huntington Beach and it was really cool it was great man it was really fun to see the movie again and have people come out and ask questions and all that and I'm trying to think who I filled in for somebody didn't show up and I was just going to go because the Jack was on the panel and then they're like you you want to talk on the thing oh well, sure I'll talk if you want me to <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so awesome. I, I was on want to be on the panel with Keith and uh and I forget we had me and Keith and Jack and Somebody else, I, I'll remember in a moment. It, takes, it always takes me a second to remember things. But um, but yeah, so that was cool to revisit that, you know? And the interesting thing is we're doing a TSOL documentary right now. And I, I just saw- Let's talk about that and then the short yeah. films that you've been working on with Jack. Yeah, okay, that'd be cool, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the TSOL doc, not doc, cause it's not, it's actually what I've realized in talking to Jack yesterday, cause I just saw the first cut of it. Uh, a couple of days ago, because I'm doing the music for that too, and so um, it's a it's really what it is, is a memoir. You know, I mean, it's it's not it's it's it it ha has some things in common with documentaries, but it's not your typical doc. I mean, we're telling the story of TSOL through a certain period of time, and and it's most it's it's really gonna it's really cool, man. I mean, Jack, it's mostly Jack telling the stories, and then but we we tell some, you know we in an interesting context, because he's kind of doing it from the stage as sort of as a spoken word thing. And then we cut away to me and Mike and Ron, and we interject stories and uh, there's other people, other, you know, pivotal people in there 
our um, our roadie human T-shirt who you know did all the TSL T-shirts and was a real close part of the band and you know and our old manager Cindy Brainy and Gary Tovar is in it and Jerry Roach is in it but it's cool because it's like it's really the story of these you know young kids doing this thing and you know trying to forge new ground or whatever just doing whatever we thought we wanted to so that's really cool and we're just digging in on it now the film looks great i mean it's in really good shape we're still waiting you know we're doing there's an animation component that's happening now and i'm getting started on the music and um but the basic thing is pretty together and it's really cool yeah i think it, it, that's it, an it, estimated uh, release date yet it's hard to say with these things you know because even when you think you're done, it's hard to know what you're done. But I would say um, early, early 2022, you know, we were kind of trying to think in terms of maybe, um, you know, South by Southwest this year or something like that, maybe premiere it there or something. So we'll see, you know, that's, that's like a, a goal, but you never know. I mean, well, oh, I can't I'll, wait, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's really cool. And it's different. It's not like any other music doc. Oh, I, I would love to go to the release party. So yeah, yeah. yeah we'll please let me there. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and so and and Jack is directing it, um, which you know you could say, well, that's a little scary to have the singer direct a documentary about the band. But he is a filmmaker now. You know what I mean? And 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 he has some experience doing that, and 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 he um, has a vision as a filmmaker, and so it's cool. It's really cool. I mean, it's nice because we've had a long term creative partnership you know beyond tsol i mean we've done a lot of other music together you know we've done the keenan jones orchestra record which is which i really love and was great and we had this thing called men's club and we did cathedral of tears together and we've written all kinds of songs in different contexts you know but but working in this film context has been cool and 288 was a really good one that we did that was the one about uh, abusers right yeah, yeah 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 i saw that one too yeah, and it was heavy, man, you know, uh, but it was, I thought it was really pretty brilliant filmmaking because the way we made it was we got people telling their real stories. They're not acting, you know, but the context. I actually know one of the guys in that film, Spike Mike. Oh, you know Spike? Yeah, he's great, man. I love him. And he told me about those experiences way before you guys even did this. Yeah, yeah like his, I'm a pretty open book, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to yeah, people. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I love about what I do now. You know what I mean? I, I like to listen. Yeah, no, it's cool, man. And, you know, it is. Offer support. Yeah, right. And it, and I think and when people have a venue to do that, and so there's that component, but the other component is, and of course, with everybody's permission, but pe telling people's story and then recontextualizing those stories with an, with a sort of a, um, in a narrative context, right? And so, and then so we, you know, and as you know, from 288, there's like a villain guy who's, fictional but the stories are real and they're just recontextualized to conform to this narrative which is i thought was like wow jack that's actually incredible for yeah. me was watching jack pop up in it i was like whoa wait, wait a minute yeah, <laughs> i was yeah, not yeah. expecting that and, and i didn't cameo, really feel yeah. anything because i want everyone to go out and watch 288 yeah yeah but it's really it's it's a really moving film uh and and it, it's it, it's um i really enjoyed doing it i think it, it's really touched a lot of people and and I I just think it was uh it was it's just cool to work with my friends in different contexts you know and I and that was a really cool thing to work with Jack as a filmmaker you know I mean it's like and and so um yeah so it's it's definitely worth checking out and it's been fun starting this journey of filmmaking with him you know because I have relationships with a lot of directors you know I mean like the, Matt Ogan who I mentioned earlier. We've done like four films together and, and like a bunch, a lot, a lot of advertising too. And, you know, um, and I have long standing relationships with a few directors. And I really love that. Besides the fact that Jack and I make music together and write songs together, you know, that, that's a different dynamic, the relationship between director and composer. And I have that with several directors. And I really like that relationship we have in that context also, you know, because my job is. If we're writing a song together, you know, we're, we're working on it. But usually film, there's something there before I start. There's a vision there that I have to conform to, that I have to support, that I have to make better, that I have to try to enhance, you know? And so that's been fun investigating that dynamic of that relationship, you know, with a filmmaker, you know, being that it's the singer of my band. But, you know, we, we can, 
I could put on different hats as needed, you know, but it's great because he's like, gonna, he's going to come up next week and we're going to work on it and kind of, I want to, I need to figure out where, he, where he's at and what I'm, I'm working on a little bit and then I'm going to, then we're going to collaborate and figure out what we're doing with the music for the movie and that, that's a really fun, I love that, you know, that whole creative stew and figuring out what it's all about, you know. I've noticed over the years that you guys have like a, a, a synergy together. You guys love working together on all these various projects and songs and videos. And, and I, I just love seeing that kind of dynamic. Yeah, um, it's just great to have. I love long term creative relationships because, you know, you do get a short end and you kind of know what the other one likes and you trust each other. And, you know, I mean, look, I work with new people all the time. And, and that's fun too. And, you know, it can be challenging, you know, but it is nice when you go, okay, I, you know, I know what I'm getting into for the most part, you know, but I don't know what I'm getting into uh, too, because it's like, I'm not sure, like I've got ideas about like, for example, with, with, the, with the TSL doc, I don't know. I have some ideas, but those we have to we have to vet those ideas. We have to work together on those. We have to figure out what we're what what's going to make sense for the film because it's not just what makes sense for me, but I ha still have to get my head around it before we collaborate. You know, I mean, I have to have a take, and it's okay if that take changes. You know, but I have to at least figure out what I'm thinking about it, be able to bring something to the table, and then go, oh, okay, this is what you're, this is what we're trying to do here. You know what I mean? So it's kind of fun to have that dynamic going, you know? That's fucking rad, man. <laughs> yeah. No, it's cool. And, you know, man, I've, I've, dude, I've known that guy since I was 18 years old, man. I mean, that's, you know, pretty almost 40 years, you know? So that's pretty crazy. Yeah. He has been through thick and thin together. Yeah, a lot of shit. <laughs> For yeah. yeah, I love Jack, man. Like, uh, He's kind of like my punk rock dad in a sense. And my, yeah, even right. my, my own father has seen him speak at AA meetings oh, and would even cool. come down to TSOL gigs just uh -huh. to say hi and chat with him for a little while. Oh, that's Sometimes cool. not even stick around for my set or your set and just bail. Right. But just to like, just to come and say hi, pay, pay your respects. Yeah, pay his respects, yeah. you know? Oh, and, cool. you know, just like you were talking about with your sons, my father was like my musical influence growing up. Oh, and then my mother always gave me a journal and told me to write, write, write still to this day. She's very supportive. Like for Christmas, she's all, I don't want any gifts. I want a poem from you. That's it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you uh, a musician too? Does he play? What's that? Did you, did your dad plays too? He plays guitar. He's more blues influenced by anything. Oh, yeah. He just got a, like a, a semi hollow body. He's pretty stoked on a Gretsch or something like that. Oh, yeah. really? What do you know? What you don't know which model? I can't I remember what model off the top of my head. I haven't even seen the guitar yet, to be honest with you. Oh, but cool. uh, but yeah, we we jammed. Tell yeah. him I got a say, I got a 1968 Gretsch 6120. He'll know what that is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. cool, man. Yeah, no, that's great, and that's one thing that I'm I'm really grateful because you know, my my folks, my dad's a lawyer, and my parents were evangelical christians when i was growing up and they were even still they were super they've always been super supportive of music and even when i said i'm joining tsol the band with the i want to fuck the dead song they're like look and i'm going to quit college <laughs> and i'm not going to be a classical piano player anymore or whatever you know they're like well you know this is this is what you want this is what you want to do we support you you know and so i was very lucky in that way and i tried to be that you know, supportive of my kids in that way too, you know, and just like, you don't have to do, you don't have to have something to fall back on. Fuck that. You'll figure it out. If it doesn't work out with music, then you do something else. But I mean, I don't have a back. I never had a backup plan and I never had to use one. I mean, and the, but they know they grew up in a house where it's like, sure, I was in bands and did that stuff, but they saw me hustling and, you know, writing music for stuff and you know, whatever. It's like, you can't just do that thing. You got to do other things too. And so my boys, you know, besides being in Fiddler, they both compose and they both produce bands and they write things for different things. You know what I mean? They have relationships with the director. They can have backups. Like even when I had the studio, I had the valet parking business. I drove right. Lyft when I really needed money. You know right. what I mean? Right. And right. Yeah. Right. You, you got to have a backup, right. even your backup sometimes. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, you just figure out a way to make it work by any means necessary. You know what I mean? You just kind of go, okay, well, you know, figure it out. If you sit around and say, well, I want to make a, I want to be a rock star. I want to make a living doing music. It's like, well, maybe that might work out. But, you know, you got, usually we got to pivot and say, okay, well, what now? And my kids, you know, I would be 
you know, there's a lot of times we would just be like killing it and be like, yeah, cool. We're going to go to Hawaii for Thanksgiving and we're going to go on vacations and do all this. And then when things tighten up, it's like, hey, you know what? Mac and cheese, we're going to the park because that's the <laughs> yeah, way right. it goes with music. You know what I mean? No problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're just, we're roughing it for a while. But, you know, we had some of the best times when we were roughing it, you know? And so they know having grown up in that environment. Trouble they, only makes you stronger. I always yeah, say that. It yeah. really does. And so even through all the COVID stuff of Fiddler being, they needed a break anyway. And they all made solo records and did stuff. And, you know, and so, but but my kids are smart about money and they know how to like, they know that you can't just uh, live like you're always, you know, making it. And so, yeah. so they're good, you know, and that's good. I'm so proud of them to get, be, get through this kind of a thing, you know, without, you know, they're still like keeping their thing rolling and staying happy and, and Fiddler is going to get back to work in 2022 and do a tour and record and stuff. So it's nice to see things coming up, you know, them getting through this and things coming back to normal, you know. Definitely tell your sons I said hi. I haven't I talked to them in like... a long, long time. Hopefully they still remember me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I don't mind. Yeah, that, that, the, the Turtle was a fun place, man. Remember Wrecking Crew too? <laughs> oh, Wrecking Crew, yeah. They were yeah, they used to love play super with influenced by the adolescents. Right, right. Yeah, right. that's right. And Joe wound up playing with the adolescents. And Elvis and Joe are right, still... I've seen them, yeah. Yeah, and Joe, Elvis and Joe's still good friends with, with Elvis and Joe are still good good friends and talk a lot and stuff. So yeah, that was a cool cool moment in time, you know. Well, uh, I hate to wrap this up. We are running out of time. We only got maybe about four minutes left. Okay. So this segment of the show, I, I like to have all my guests leave an empowering message or something to inspire the, the viewers out there, the listeners. Um, you know, you have a, a certain quote or saying or ethos in life, feel free to share with everybody. Okay, well, well that's a tall order, but I can say, <laughs> don't take things personally. That's a one, that's one motto that I live by. And, you know, and realizing that it's not about your plans all the time, pivot. Pivoting is like probably the most important thing. Uh, like, I, mean, I have I have different mottos that go that happen at different times, but at the moment, that's one that I'm really big on. I'm a I'm I, I like the Stoics, man. I, I you know I, I appreciate Stoic philosophy. And the thing is, just re recontextualizing when things happen. I don't really judge things as good or bad anymore. I just say, well, things happen, and I'm along for the ride. And so I'll um, I'm gonna re take another look at this. I'm going to reframe this and imagine that this is exactly how things are supposed to be. This is exactly what I want. And I'm going to, because the, I would have realized that the time that I the most, the time that I waste is the time bemoaning those things. It's not the bad things, quote unquote, bad things that happen. It's the, it's the time wasted from and out about them, you know? And so if you can not bum out about them and just go, well, things do happen and we have to pivot and figure out how to approach it from a place of like, well, I learned something from it, you know, or maybe it's something coming around the corner that I don't see. So I try not to imagine that I got it all figured out. And so I, I leave that to, I just show up and do my part, you know, and that, that works out pretty good. I will, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. I just told my mother this one. It was pretty good. I read it in um, Ryan Holiday's Daily Stoic book, but, and there it, it's, a, it's about, uh, they're talking about logos and which is just sort of the life energy and the direction that life takes you right so it's like <clears throat> so you're a dog and you're chained to a cart and that cart is going down the road and you have a certain amount of leeway on that cart well you can yank against it or you can stay up ahead of it you can jog along the side of it and have a nice day but if you pull too hard against it, you're just going to get dragged along and life is going to take you in directions that you don't necessarily want to go sometimes, but that cart's going. So either you're going to get dragged along behind it or you can get up ahead of it. You could run along with it and figure out where it's going and see that coming. So I love that. And I've been telling, that's one of my late, like uh, sort of little uh, mottos of late, you know, that I love that little story. And just thinking about life in those terms and just, I don't have a lot of expectations. You know, I have a great life, man. I mean, I have a really, I, I, beyond my wildest dreams. So I don't worry about my wildest dreams anymore because I'm given more than I expect. 
but I, cause I don't expect anything because I'm like, you know, I don't feel like I'm owed anything and I'm willing to take life however it comes at me. And so usually that's pretty good, man. And when it's tough and when there's difficulties, I just, I don't get too bummed out about them. I just kind of try to pivot and, you know, look at it a different angle and do my best to kind of like do my part as much as I can, you know? So I don't know, but that's, that's what I got for today at least. Well, Greg, it's been a pleasure having you on the show um, once again, and it's a pleasure to just see your face. <laughs> it's yeah, been no, it's years. great hanging out, Sulo. It's, a, it's been too long, man, and um, I really appreciate our friendship and all the cool things we've been able to do together and your and your uh, friendship of the band and, and enthusiasm for the band and all that stuff, man. It's, it means a lot to us, really. It does, and to me personally, so... Um, I'm stoked to get to do this with you and I appreciate you having me on, man. Definitely. All right. Any final words? Anything else? Ah, uh, gosh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> just enjoy life, man. It's, it's, we, we have a choice. We can enjoy it or not enjoy it. And I'll choose to enjoy it today, man. <laughs> Jack says, uh, have a great day because it is your choice. Just, it is, that's a good one. Let's finish with that. Have a good day because it is your choice. So let's end with that. Have a great day because it is your choice. That wraps up another episode for The King's Couch. I'm your host, Sulo King, and this is my special guest, Greg King. Thanks for tuning in. All right, Sulo. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, catch you later.